is okay yes the recording has started alhamdulillah is that the good things about islamic inheritance is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described islamic inheritance in the quran itself and he described the share of the people and we will come to how allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has described them and the meanings of it the benefit of it has been that the uh, main things with inheritance are all agreed upon. So that we find the Sahaba practicing inheritance in a uniform way for the most common kind of situations. There's actually very little ikhtilaf in inheritance. The inheritance ikhtilaf comes into situations that are you know, unusual, a little bit rare, and there has been some difference of opinion amongst the Sahaba, so therefore there's ikhtilaf amongst the fuqaha as well. So what makes this easy from my perspective is that I'm really not having to tell you, well, you know, Imam Abu Hanifa said this, and Imam Shafi said this, and the opinion of Umar bin al-Khattab is this, and the opinion of Ali bin Abi Talib radiallahu anhum is this. So, you know, the, the topic is easier from that perspective. The issue, obviously, living in a non-Muslim country is that the law of the land applies if you do not have a will. From the fiqhi perspective, if a person was living in a Muslim country that applied the sharia, then it is not compulsory on that person to have an inheritance, you know, a will written out. The will, in fact, is there optional. But in a non-Muslim country like this, if you die, then all of your wealth will go to your spouse. And uh, if they're not present, then after that, whatever is the law of the uh, country. And what happens is that you may be very religious and when you die, your children may end up taking this money to court to fight over it. And these fights, you know, if you're very, very rich, they can actually go on for generations. So number one, that's a problem. And secondly, it is actually your duty to ensure that your wuratha are taught about who should get what. And the alternative is that they should be taught to go to a alim to sort out who should get what, and they shouldn't just follow the law. So to avoid all of this conflict, a person should write down a will. I can speak for Sydney, I know there's some people who joined from international places, is that it's not very expensive to make a will. It's in the region of somewhere between $250 to $350. So that's, it becomes necessary for a person to make a will before he dies. Of course, the issue is that you and I don't know when we'll die. So it's important that we make a will as soon as possible. What is the order of expenses? I'm not gonna spend a huge time on this, but it's something to understand before we talk about inheritance itself, is that when the person dies, the first cost that must be paid for is all the burial costs. So whatever is the cost of washing the person, if you're paying someone to do it, the cost of buying the, the coffin, the cost of digging up the earth and putting them in there. And in some countries, you actually have to purchase the land that the person is being put into. So for all those reasons, there will be costs involved in that. And that will come out of the, in the, the assets that are left behind by the person. The second thing that will be done is the paying of any debts. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions three or four times in Surah An-Nisa, مِن بَعْدِ وَصِيَّتِهِ يُصَى بِهَا أَوْدَيْنِ أو يُصِي بِهَا أَوْدَيْنِ And the UC comes first, which is the optional will of the person. But in fact, the fuqaha are in complete agreement because of the actions of the Prophet Sallallahu that the dain, which is the debt, will be paid first. Now let's suppose that a person has left behind $100,000 and his debts actually account to $100,000. Then all of that money will be paid for the debt and then there is nothing left for the inheritance. 
So when we are, remember when we are discussing the will and the inheritance, it is in the situation where someone has left something behind, whether that be $50, whether that be $50 million. Where a person has nothing to leave behind, then obviously none of these things will be applying. After the paying of the debts, the next thing to do is to deal with the optional will. And this will be up to one third of the inheritance. After the optional will, it will be distribution to the remainder of the heirs. The critical thing to understand with the optional will is you cannot appoint, you cannot give this one third, or I should say up to one third, to someone who will already receive inheritance. Let's go through an example. The person called Farooq dies and he leaves behind assets worth $80,000. His burial costs are $10,000 and he owes his friend $10,000 who turns up and says, well, your uh, relative so-and-so owed me $10,000 and he has the necessary proof for that. Then the residual amount after taking away these two costs is $60,000. Then the, the will of the person who has died, in this case Farooq, will be looked at, did he want to give any money? In this example, he hasn't wanted to give away any money for sadaqa or for, for a poor relative or the like. And so this 60,000 will then be divided uh, to the heirs. Then, this is the most important part of the lecture, this little slide here, okay? And you really need to understand this slide if you're to understand any part of the lecture. Sit down, be quiet, shh, be quiet. The dhawil furud are those who are prescribed a share. So you will hear me over and over again in the lecture today discussing dhawil furud. And the dhawil asaba are those who get the remainder. So this is a hadith narrated in Bukhari and Muslim that Abdullah bin Abbas radiallahu anhu said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Alhiqu al-fara'idha bi ahliha fama baqiya fahuwa li awla rajulin dhakar. That Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu reported the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, give the shares to those who are entitled to them. So these are the will furud. And what remains over goes to the nearest male here. Now we will be discussing this uh, again and I'll be giving you examples. And so, but this is the key part to remember in the lecture. Who are the standard here? So they are, uh, a number of people, and I'm not going to go through everyone here. The reason that I've put up this picture, and as a disclaimer, I've taken this from our website, is that to understand relationships, we have to remember that whenever we're mentioning a person, this is the person that's died in red, he is the deceased, then all relationship will come from that person. This is really important to understand. Sounds very simple, but a lot of people got confused when I did this the first time. When we deal with the person that's left over, the spouse of the person, then they're, they're in that same generation. When we deal with the son, we mean the son of the deceased. When we say the daughter, we mean the daughter of the deceased. When we say the father, then we mean the father of the deceased and so on. Who are the Dawil Furud that are described in the Quran? These are the people who have a prescribed portion when conditions are met. And we'll go through each of these people. So who are they? They are the father, the mother, the spouse, and the daughter. These are the four categories that are considered dhawil furud. There are other dhawil furud that I will discuss and they are the siblings and they will come later in the course. The critical thing to notice in this list here is that the son is not in this list, okay? And I'll explain in a, in a few minutes. Oh, actually, I'm doing it now. I forgot I'm doing it now. Who are they, Dawil Asaba? So we did the Dawil Furud. 
these are the four key people to remember is the father, the mother, the spouse, and the daughter. Then we have the Dhawil Asaba. The Dhawil Asaba are those male relatives that get a remainder after fixed portions have been given out and there are remaining fractions. Okay, so that's the key thing. Are there remaining fractions or not? And as we go through the rules, you'll start to think, well, do the sons ever get anything? But when we come to the examples, you understand, yes, they do get things. Now, uh, in terms of these male hairs, I have to make a correction here. The female counterparts are eligible in the case of the son, the son's son, the grandson, the brother, and the brother's sister, sorry, the, the deceased sister. Those are the cases where the female counterparts become eligible when these male the Asaba are eligible. And then the next thing to understand is that if the son is present, then the son's son is no longer eligible. And I'll show this in a graph in the next uh, slide. This is the kind of way, and this is the way I've memorized it in my head, and I'm hoping that this helps you as well. The Asaba are the nearest male relative. So the first, according to uh, you know, the ijma, the first relative that is the nearest relative is in fact their son. So we have the deceased, we go downwards, it's their son. The next eligible, oop, go back. The next eligible person is the son's son, not the daughter's son, the son's son, and that will be the grandson. And you can keep going downwards. I haven't made further boxes. You can have the great grandson. That will have to be along a male lineage. Okay. Then we go upwards. And the next person is the father. And the person after that is the father's father. This is not a maternal grandfather, it's a paternal grandfather. Then we keep going upwards. And obviously the likelihood of a great grandfather being alive is very unlikely. So at this point, we go sideways to the brother. So the key thing to understand is that the brother is only becoming eligible when there is no descendants, no direct ascendants, nothing below, nothing above. When the brother is not alive, then we look at, does this brother have a nephew? if not the nephew's son. Likelihood of anything beyond that is low. So we go back up one generation to the father and then come across again. And we have the paternal uncle. And then we go down to his male lineage, cousin's son, cousin's grandson. If there's nothing, we go to the grandfather and go to the brother of the grandfather. And then we go downwards. One key thing to understand, this is actually a simplified version of the Vilasaba. Why do I say simplified? Because there should be an additional step here after the brother where you go to the paternal brother. So a brother that shares the father, but not the mother, and then his son and then his grandson. And then you go to the uncle and then the paternal uncle and then so on. So it's a little bit complicated, but I've made it a simplified version. The second thing to mention here is there is ikhtilaf amongst the fuqaha on whether the brother comes before the grandfather, but I've simplified it here and put the grandfather first. So if you want to try and memorize an easy way, you go down and you go up, you go across and you go down again. Then you come back and you go across and you go down again. You come back and you go across and you go down again. That's kind of how I memorize in my brain. Hopefully that helps you too. Now, so that's understanding the main principles around Dawil Furud and Dawil Asaba. Then we'll come to the rules that are mentioned in the order of the Quran. So 
I'd like you to make some notes as we're, you know, talking through these rules. And the reason is that I'm taking this entirely from the Quran. I'm actually not going to be presenting any ahadith here because Allah himself has presented this in clear terms in the Quran. There's very little need to actually start to look at other things. Now, some of the things I will be mentioning do come from a hadith, but I'm not going to be mentioning them. The first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is, يُوسِيكُمُ اللَّهُ fi أَوْلَادِكُمْ لِذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَانِ That the first simple rule Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is that rule number one is the ratio of males to females is two to one. Now, Allah mentions this actually twice in Surah An-Nisa. So they don't actually apply to all categories. They actually apply to the ones where the female of that category is sharing with the male of that category. Okay. Now, that's hard to remember. So I've simplified it and put it. These are the three categories. They're the sons and daughters, full brothers and sisters, paternal brothers and sisters. So remember, paternal brothers, are they share the father, but the mother is different. The second condition that's not mentioned in the Quran, but you must remember it, is that they must be in the same category and generation. Okay? So we're not going to be doing a share between sons and sisters, for example. We'd only be doing it with sons and daughters or brothers and sisters. Rule number two, if there are no sons, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَإِن كُنَّ nisa and Nisa are women. If there are no sons and we're dealing with a category of Nisa only, then فَوْقَ thnatayni. I actually should put in English first, they are two or more daughters, then they share in two thirds. So for those who speak Arabic, thnatayni, they will know is two. And thuluth is one third, but when you add the alif at the end, that becomes a pair. So a pair of thirds become two thirds. Now here, for those who know very good linguistics, they'll understand that that means more than two. So why am I saying two or more? Now, the two or more comes from the practice of the Sahaba. All of them agreed that if it was two or more, it is the same as having more than two. Okay. Then what in kanat wahidatan and wahid is how we say uh, sorry this the actual transcription hasn't come across very well when I copied it. Uh, they put a hamza there for I don't know why. Anyway uh, so when you have wahid then uh, that's one and that's the female form. If you add a tamarbuta it becomes the female form. Wahidatan falaha nisf and nisf means half. So that's how you remember that. When kunna nisa and fawqath nataini, if there are two or more daughters, they share in two thirds, and then one daughter gets a half. Let me, is there any questions so far? Nothing in the chat, so I'll assume there are no questions. Okay. Rule number three is the uh, Parents. So the next thing that comes in the ayat is So I've written this down as 3a and I'm, I'm expecting you guys to write notes down because when we do the examples, you will need to have these notes with you. If the deceased had a child or children, now in Arabic you see here, in kana lahu walad. And the walad just means a child. So the gender here does not matter. It can be a boy or a girl. And we're not talking, remember about the relationships, it's the deceased children, right? So the person has died, does this person have children? Then the deceased's parents, the person that has died, his or her parents, they get one sixth each. Okay. Both the father and the mother will get one sixth each. Next rule. 
فَإِن لَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ وَلَدٌ وَوَرِثَهُ أَبَوَاهُ فَلِأُمِّهِ الثُّلُثِ So we learned a new Arabic word in the ayah before. As sudus is one-sixth. And then we come back to the thuluth, which we learned already, which is one-third. فَإِن لَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ وَلَدٌ If the deceased did not have any children and his parents are the heirs, then the mother gets one third. Note here that the father's share is not mentioned. He is no longer furud. Okay. In the first situation in 3a, he is one of the furud. Both parents get one sixty. In this section, only the mother is the furud. Last example, no, uh, last uh, rule for parents, rule 3C. If the deceased had two or more children, فَإِن كَانَ لَهُ إِخْوَةٌ فَلِأُمِّهِ السُّدُسِ Now, إِخْوَةٌ in Arabic means a plural form of siblings. So usually plural forms mean three or more, okay? Because the dual form would be أَخَوَان. However, all of the Sahaba had used ikhwa to mean two or more. So there's no ikhtilaf on this. And the reason for this is that the Arab used to use ikhwa particularly for anyone that had two or more siblings, even though the linguistic form means three or more. They, in this situation, the mother gets one sixth. Again, the father's share is not mentioned. He is not furud in this situation either. Now, one thing to understand here, the siblings can be full siblings. They can be maternal siblings or paternal siblings, any kind of siblings, but they must be related to the person that has died. Okay. Now we finish with ayah number 11 of Surah An-Nisa and we go on to ayah number 12. So those of you who have the Quran with them, they can uh, look at these things. So the next bit is the rule for the husband. If the husband, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to them directly, for you is half nisfu, what your azwaj left behind if they had children. That's the key thing. It doesn't matter that you have children from a previous marriage. Did you have a child with that wife? If there are no children, then the husband gets half. If there are children, the husband gets a quarter. Look at the wording here for those who know Arabic. فَإِنْ كَانَ لَهُنَّ وَلَدٌ For those, if they, the female, the wife who died had children. Okay? That's the key bit here. The next is, the, what does the wife get? If, rule 5a, if there are no children, then they get a quarter, a rubu. Okay? So we did actually nisf before, and we did a rubu. So we come again and do roba, which is one fourth. If there, if the husband did not have children, and if the husband had children, then they will get a thuman, which is one eighth. Okay. Now, what before we go into blocking rules, I want to mention here one key thing is that. In ayah number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Allah is alim in Allah kana aliman hakima. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing and he is all wise. And so one of the definitions of hikmah is wad'u shay'i fi mahallihi is to put the thing in its correct place. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows exactly how much a given person should get. So when we look at the portion that the wife gets, she gets half of what the husband is getting in terms of fractions. When we look at 
how much a female is getting, she is getting half the amount of the male. So then, you know, people start to say, well, you know, Islam is wrong and this and that and whatnot. And the key thing we have to remember as Muslims is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all knowing. He knows exactly who, sh who is deserving of what amount. And a little bit that we can say is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the responsibility of the finances with the man and he doesn't put the responsibilities of the finances with any female. Secondly, the woman is dhawil furud in three different situations. One is she is dhawil furud as a mother. She is a dhawil furud as a wife. She is a dhawil furud as a daughter. And in addition, when she gets married, she gets a mahr. So in the situation where her husband dies, then she gets married again, and then she receives mehr again from the new husband. And that is, you know, what the purpose should be. So that it is unfortunate that in many cultures that when the husband dies, no matter how young the woman is, she doesn't get married again. And this is really, you know, not in keeping with Islamic principles. Uh, the, the haq of the woman is that she should be looked after financially, so she should get married again and the husband will give her a new dowry. So whatever money she is getting in inheritance, she actually does not have to spend it on anyone. And in fact, she does not have to spend it on her needs either because her wali is required to spend on her. And that's some of the hikmah behind some of these fractions. Okay, this is slightly difficult to understand, but I mentioned it in when I was talking about the will asaba. We'll go back to that Dawil Asaba chart. So remember that when I said the nearest male relative, let's say, is the son. He gets the remainder, which means that the grandson doesn't get anything. And then everyone else who is not Dawil Furud, they don't get anything because the first male relative got the remainder, right? So then that means there are blocking rules. The presence of a person blocks a more distant relative. So the sons prevent grandsons from shares. The father prevents the grandfather, grandfather from shares. The mother prevents the grandmother, etc. Okay. One key thing you're learning now is that the son and father prevent siblings from getting a share. The siblings present, prevent more further relatives from getting a share which leads us very nicely to the next rule, which is the Kalala rule. The Kalala itself, there was some difference amongst the Sahaba. So there is a little bit of difference amongst the Fuqaha as well. And I'm gonna simplify things again for you. Is that the Kalala is one that does not have any male descendants and no father alive either. The difference's opinion is with regards to the grandfather. But again, I'm going to make it simple. In the situation where there is no son, no son's son, etc., no father alive, then the siblings become eligible. Then there are two situations. Are there maternal siblings present and not present? No maternal siblings present. Okay? So, because the Quran does it in this way, even though this situation is uncommon, I'm going to present it first. If they are, if there is one maternal sister or brother, they get one sixth each. If there are two or more, then they share in a maximum of one third. So it doesn't matter that that they had seventeen maternal brothers or sisters; they will share up to one third, no more than that and the ratio is one to one. So male to female is one to one. And Al-Qurtubi mentions that this is the only situation where males to female are sharing in one to one. The last ayah of Surah Nisa gives us the last ruling from the Quran, which is where there are no maternal siblings and the siblings are the inheritors, then if there is one sister, she gets a half. And this is very similar rules to the daughter, right? So one daughter, they get half. If there are two or more sisters, they share in two thirds. 
And if there's one brother, he takes everything. And if they are both kinds, the ratio is two to one, just like we mentioned before. To see how we're going for time. I'm gonna spend five minutes on advanced. Uh, actually, I've got to do this first, right? So if an inheritor has murdered the person, even if he is Dawil Furud or the first Dawil Asaba, he will not get anything. Okay, so the Qatil Ahmad stops the person from receiving anything. Non-Muslims cannot inherit from Muslims, and Muslims cannot inherit from non-Muslims. Slaves obviously don't exist in our time, but slaves cannot inherit, and you can't inherit from slaves either. Okay, so at this point, if you know, if you're like me, and when I was reading the subject, I was thinking, well, what happens if the fractions add up to less than one? And what happens if the fractions add up to more than one? So this is an example where all the fractions together add up to more than one. Then Umar bin Khattab had this in his lifetime when he was the Khalifa and he gathered the Sahaba and they agreed on this. So again, there is no ikhtilaf amongst the fuqaha. There is ijma in this situation. Now, let's give an example. There, the disease leaves behind, sorry, I didn't have time, time to go through all the typos, leaves behind a husband and two sisters. Hopefully you have been making notes. So the husband, there are no children left behind, right? So the husband is due half. There are two sisters. They are due two thirds because there is no brother. They don't have to share in two to one. There is nobody else that is inheriting. So the sisters, two sisters share one third. But when we add half and two thirds, we get a whole and one third. And obviously you can't do that. So the owl rule is applied and everyone's proportion is reduced proportionally. Everyone's fractions is reduced proportionally. So when we do that, the husband goes from half down to three over seven, that's his fraction. And the two sisters go from two thirds, they go down to four over seven. That means that each sister gets two over seven. That's just year six fractions. I'm not going to teach you fractions today. OK. This is very, very rare. But just to be aware of, because sometimes when you're living in the Western world, these situations can happen where there is actually no other relatives. If all the fractions add up to less than one, obviously the next step is to go to the asba, as we said before. If there are no other relatives, then it goes back to Dawil Furud and their share is increased except the spouses. Okay? So the spouses do not get a boost. Everyone else gets a boost. The difference of opinion is that in Abu Hanifa says that after Dawil Asba, it goes to Dawil Arham. So those are relatives that are not related by a male relative. For example, it can be your mother's brother, okay? And that kind of thing. If there are no Dawil Arham, then it goes back to Dawil Furud. These are very advanced inheritance things and you probably don't really need to, to, to remember this. This is one more advanced ruling. And again, because this could happen, you know, in the Western world, I'm gonna mention it. This is called the ruling of Umar as well, because this again happened in the lifetime of Umar al-Bin al-Khattab anhu, and all of the Sahaba agreed on this when it happened, which is that when there is a case of a spouse and parents only, whether the spouse is a wife or a husband doesn't matter, then the parent's share is based on the residual after the spouse receives the share, okay? So therefore, the spouse's share is the same and the parent's share is reduced. So rule 4a, no children, husband gets half. Rule 3b is there's no children, so the mother should get one third. But now she gets one sixth because the husband took half, the residual is half. So she gets 
one third of half, which becomes one sixth. And the father is the first asba, so he gets one third. Uh, that's probably going to be hard for you to remember, but just remember that in the case of a spouse and parents only, there is a special ruling called the ruling of Allah. Okay. Now we're going to do some examples because I really find that in the situation of um, inheritance, you really want to do some examples so that you can understand, you know, how the calculations happen. So those of you who were, you know, with me in the class last week, I've changed around the examples a little bit. So, you know, you can't get away with just using the same calculations we did last time. So this is a little bit interactive, uh, you know, uh, if you like, you can unmute yourself and, and try and guess the answer. And if you like, you can put it down in the chat. And so Abdullah is a person in, in uh, red. He's the person that's died. Okay. The, the squares for males, the circles are for females. That's just the standard way we do genetic uh, family trees. So Abdullah has died. He leaves behind uh, his mother and his son and three daughters. And uh, let's just assume, I've made a mistake here again. There is, the, the wife is, is died as well in the past, okay? So we're dealing with one mother, three daughters, and one son. How will we divide things? I'm waiting for people to put things down in the chat or maybe unmute yourselves and, and say some things. Let's, okay, I'll try and help you guys. Let's start with the mother. What ruling should be applied for the mother? Okay, got something in the chat. Mother gets one sixth, why is that? Okay, Hanya has said that the mother gets one sixth son, two thirds, daughter, one third, but there are three daughters. Good, Abu Sufir said the mother gets one sixth because there this deceased person had children, right? So the mother's share is set now. So now we have to decide is how much do the daughters get? How does the son get anything at all? And if he does, how much does he get? Come on, guys. I'll give you guys a minute to think about it. Daughters, one third each. So that means they get, okay, Mama Jane, each daughter, one sixth. Okay. All right. What about, so the son gets one third. All right, and is there anything left over? All right, we're starting to get some different answers. It's good, people participating. Okay, so Brother Muhammad has said none. Okay, let's look at the answers. The rule 3a, as I taught you, mother gets one sixth when there are children. Okay, there are no other furud. Now, I taught you that daughters are furud, but they're only furud when there is no son. When there is a son, the ratio that is applied is two to one. Okay, so when we apply the uh, ruling the daughters are not fruit because the son is present. The mother got one sixth, then the remaining amount is five over six. We divide that between the sons and daughters in a ratio of two to one. Okay, so the son gets one third, each of the daughters get one sixth each. Right, 
So half plus one third plus one sixth is a whole. So we've divided it all up. Well done, everyone. Okay, example number two. So the red person is Dawood. He has unfortunately died and he's left behind a wife, okay? He has left behind a daughter, a... Um, did I have a mother in this example? Yes, I had a mother in this example. I um, can't remember if I had a mother in this example. Anyway, uh, he has three brothers, okay? He's got three brothers and one wife and one daughter. Let's keep it that way. All right, far away in the chat. I think I did have, let's put it down as the, um, the mother being there. Um, okay, so wife got, um, yep, sorry, I've made a mistake here. This should really be a, yes, a father. Okay, there is a father there. I'm losing my mind now. So there's a father there. There is a wife and there's a daughter. And so the father gets one six, as you've written. Someone else has written the daughter gets a half. How much does the wife get? One eighth, very good. Everyone's doing really well. And the father's none. Why? Well, then what does the father get? Does he one, get nothing? One sixth. One sixth. Okay. What about the brothers? All right, people are thinking the father doesn't get anything. So remember the rule was if the deceased has children, the mother gets one third and the father is no longer furud, right? So then the furud that are left in this example is the wife, she gets one eighth, the daughter gets a half, the part that is left is three over eight. Did I do my, did I do my fractions correctly? Yes, three over eight. Now then the question is, we did all the furud, and the uh, person that is left over is the father and the brothers, right? So then we have to say, well, we did all the furud, so we now have to do the wil asaba. The first the wil asaba is the father, so he gets the remainder. The brothers get nothing because it's not a Kalala situation. The father exists, so he is blocking everyone else from getting anything. So the brothers don't get anything in this situation, right? So, um, yeah, I did have the right example. So the daughter gets half, the wife gets one eighth because there are children. The father is the first asper, he gets the remaining, which is three eighths. The brothers get nothing, okay? We got enough time to do some more examples. Okay, this time Ahmed dies. I haven't made a diagram this time. Let's see how well you guys understand it. He leaves behind a father. A mother is the deceased father and is the deceased person's mother. His two sisters, one brother, and then he has his grandfather and his maternal grandmother. How much does each person get? Come on, guys. Let's try and work it out. The mother, so Abu Safir, very good. He's uh, racing off the blocks. Mother gets one third, excellent. How much does each other person get? Close the door, Baba. Thank you. I know it's a little bit confusing, isn't it? Because there's, there's, there's grandfathers here, there's grandmothers, there's brothers and sisters. All right, so, so someone else has said that the father gets one third. 
what was rule number three C? You have to be quiet, Hafsa. Shh, you have to be quiet. What was rule number three C? Who remembers? Okay, we've got someone saying the father gets two thirds. If the deceased has two or more siblings, how much does the mother get? One sixth. One Very sixth. good, one sixth, excellent, right? Then which other the will furud is left? Dad? Mm, in this situation, he can't be, yeah. he's not a will furud when there's two or more brothers and sisters. There are no other the will furud left. Okay, the father's present presence blocks the siblings. The father's presence blocks the grandfather. The mother's presence blocks the grandmother, right? So the first, the will asaba is the father. He gets five over six, okay? So this was a little bit tricky, just, you know, tickling your brain. I know some people are writing saying their brain hurts. I'm sorry about that. But, you know, the fractions and different rulings, this is just doing some examples to show you how they were applied. Their rule number three C, there are multiple siblings, right? There is two sisters and one brother. That means there's more than two. Actually, there's, you know, even two is enough. That means the mother's fraction goes down from one third to one sixth. But because... The first Dawil Asaba is the father, he gets the remainder. It's not divided with anyone else. Okay. And when I did this, the lecture the first time, one person's comment, one it, what comment was that, oh, it's a lucky father. Well, yes, he's lucky, he got a lot, but also at the same time, he's having to look after his children and having to uh, look after their finances. So please go outside, you're making noise. Okay, so um, I think we have enough time to do two more examples. Um, okay, this uh, person has died and let's call him Muhammad. So Muhammad's, uh, he leaves behind his wife and a daughter and his mother uh, one brother and three sisters. This time I think I've taught you guys enough principles that I'm just going to be quiet and let you say things. Okay. Okay, so we got wife one third, mother one sixth, daughter half. Okay, good. What do we do after that? Let me ask you guys, sisters get nothing. Okay, is the brother eligible? It's a Kalala, yay, very good. It's a Kalala, excellent guys, well done. So because it's a Kalala and because there are brothers and sisters together, what's the ratio? The ratio is two to one, okay? Very good, good work, well done. You guys are experts at this now. Um, so let's go through the answers. The mother got one sixth, as you guys said, the wife got one eighth because there are children. And the, you know, the mother also gets one sixth because there are children. And they, there's only one daughter, that should say one daughter instead of daughters, sorry. And she gets a half. All the Furud got their share, the remaining share is five over 24. Again, year six fractions, I'm not here to teach you fractions. The first, Asba is the brother, the sisters become eligible, okay? So now we divide it as two to one. Each sister got one over 24 and the brother got two over 24 or one over 12. All right, last example. I know you guys are getting tired. Last example, guys, come on. This person has died, Fatima has died. She leaves behind two daughters, her mother, and one son who I've put in black has already died, but he has a grandson that is alive. Yeah. 
Okay, mother gets one sixth, well done. Yeah, come on guys. Daughters two thirds, well done. So we've decided what the mother got, the daughters got. Does the grandson get anything? Well done, the grandson gets the remainder. And so why is that? So he is the first Dawilasaba, right? These two daughters, they don't have a brother. So there's no sons, no other sons at all. So there's no one to block the grandson, okay? Because only the son will block the grandson. The son would have been, if he had been alive, the first Dawilasaba. Because he's not alive, we go down and we find a grandson that is alive. This grandson becomes the first Dawilasaba. He gets the remainder. So her Fatima's mother got one sixth. The two daughters got two thirds. They shared that. What's left over is one sixth. So the grandson gets that amount. Okay, I think that was the last slide. So um, we've got, I, we all need to run to Aisha. So we'll have two minutes for questions. Any questions you can ask in the chat here, and also alternatively, you can message me on uh, WhatsApp. And we have really just done basic rules of inheritance. I haven't touched on any kind of advanced rules of inheritance, really just done a couple of them that can happen, but they are rare things that do happen that have their own specific rulings that come from the Sahaba again. So I think the thing to say at the end of all of this, most situations I would say will be covered by the rules that we have done today. And when you're dealing with unusual situations, then the thing to do is to go to a alim and uh, discuss your given individual scenario. I guess if there's uh, no other questions, then we'll stop the lecture there. And as I said, you know, you feel free to uh, message me privately on WhatsApp and we can go through any questions. Um, where do we register our will? Okay, so in Australia, you need to uh, uh, go through a, a lawyer to do that. Um, the Imams Council of uh, Australia have a link where uh, you can liaise with uh, their group and they can make a will for you. And uh, the um, cost of that is about $350. And there are, I know that there's a lawyer down in Wollongong that has been doing it for many of the brothers and sisters in Sydney. I think he charges around about 250 or that amount. So the lawyer will then, you know, make up the will for you and then you keep a copy and you give a copy to the person that would execute the will. And you also give a copy to the person that you designate as being the guardian uh, uh, if, if you died and you had uh, children who are under the age of puberty, that kind of thing. Obviously, you know, there may be different laws in other countries, but that's the, the, the kind of gist of it. All right, I will stop sharing. Jazakumullahu khair, everyone. Um, Jazakallahu khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.